Pronto. Um, good afternoon. Um, I hope that everybody can hear us and see us here in the in our premises in Camões. Um, so um, we are here for a book release, a translation of um, a novel, a novel, no, sorry, a short story of uh, Maria Elsa Barros, sorry, Maria Elsa da Rocha in English Life Stories. The book uh, has been translated by uh, Dr. Paulo de Castro, Paulo Meli Castro. Um, he's a professor, a lecturer and professor of uh, comparative lit literature in, in uh, Glasgow University, Scotland. Uh, we, we, we will talk also about uh, um, Goan literature and basically the uh, Goan literature in Portuguese is translated to English, and um, it's important to speak a little bit uh, about uh, why to translate literature, Goan literature in Portuguese uh, to English. First of all, because plurili plurilingualism is something that everybody um, is looking for. And there's a huge advantage of using and knowing and learning different languages. But personally, I think that we in Goa, especially in Goa, we have to, to, to think in keeping uh, the text at uh, its original in Portuguese. Uh, and why? For also very, uh, very clear and very um, uh, obvious reason, uh, the community of Portuguese speakers in the world is now around 270, uh, uh, 270 millions. Uh, according to the uh, United Nations, by the end of this, world, this century, there will be 500 millions of people speaking Portuguese, most of them in Africa. Um, and uh, it's important that the texts and the Goan literature written in Portuguese uh, in Goa can be um, read and studied um, in many in, in different languages and as much as possible for many people. Well, the other thing also that I'd like to, to say before starting our book release and a series, um, some questions and answers, a small discussion, um, it's about the, the future of Portuguese language in, in Goa. Uh, as you know, I've been working for the promotion in the, and the diffusion of Portuguese language in Goa. And I think that people, not only in Goa, but in all the world, they should look to the Portuguese written and spoken in Goa, uh, should be kept as it was initially in the original. And the translations like uh, the one that uh, um, Paulo has done, and uh, he, he will do much more in the future, I'm sure, it, they are very important because not only the students, the so-called non-Goan students who are learning Portuguese in Goa, they will learn uh, a lot of culture, a, a lot of history, a lot of language, reading the book, the books, the text in it, its original in Portuguese, Portuguese written by Goans, but also other students who don't know Portuguese, they also can read and can learn a lot about Goa reading the translations in English, and some of them in Konkani, Marathi, or in Hindi. So I'm not against the translations. What I would like to suggest to Frederick, it's that we should keep in mind in the near future to have translations in different languages. Making the old texts that my students are studying in photocopies uh, and sometimes sharing PDF files, having the book, because I'm a little traditional and having a book smelling the book, it's different than having in digital format. So if we could have in the future, the, these texts, these texts that show so much about the, the intercultural dialogue uh, that happened uh, and is still happening in Goa, uh, reading in Portuguese or in English or in Hindi or in Konkani, it will be very important and very interesting. 
The other thing I would like to say is that this, uh, this translation uh, was financed by Camões and the uh, Direção Geral, the, um, in English, I can't remember. Um, DG Lab. DG Lab, Direção Geral uh, dos Livros, do Arquivos e Bibliotecas. So it shows that uh, um, in Portugal, in Brazil, we are very keen in promoting Goan literature. Uh, this is why Paulo, Frederick, myself, and many other of our friends, they are uh, following us on Zoom um, and others um, on following on YouTube. Uh, Fatima, I forgot to mention Fatima. Um, 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 Eda, uh, and many others, they belong to a group called Pensando Goa. And uh, uh, it, it, this is a project very important. Uh, initiated by the uh, Universidad de São Paulo. And um, this project, these translations came in the process of this, this, this work. So I think that I have, uh, I've taken too much time. I would like to speak in Portuguese. Um, as you see, I, I'm always struggling with this language, uh, but uh, in order to be able uh, to be understood by many other people, not only from my students and my colleagues, I, I made this uh, initial uh, speech in, in, in English, in, in a bad English, but the English that uh, uh, enabled me to communicate with you. Thank you very much for being here with us. Um, and now I would like to, um, to request Cielo. Cielo, uh, are you following us? Yes, yes, I'm following. <clears throat> Very well. So now, um, Cielo, um, Cielo Festino, uh, she's also very well known in Goa. She has been doing uh, amazing uh, work uh, in uh, studying and, uh, and um, uh, finding texts, literary texts written by Goans, um, and also with a very interesting approach that particularly I appreciate. Uh, it's um, a didactic approach of uh, liter literature. And uh, this is also why it's very important to have the translations of books like uh, Monsoon or Monsoon or uh, Life Stories Now. It's very important that we can um, use the studies of these scholars, the translations that we can use with the pedagogic and didactic purpose and using in our programs in, in at Go University, in colleges and in schools. I remember just one short uh, sentence or statement. I remember by 2010, 2011, I made a very naive comment uh, to Frederick saying that at that time, I believe that we could have a full program in Portuguese language in university using only Goan writers. I was not wrong. The problem was books and studies and the essays on the writers were not available. And now they are available. And I'd like to, uh, to, uh, to thank to all these people who are doing amazing uh, work in promoting Goan literature, uh, making the books available to different people, um, but also again, and I'm insisting, uh, it's important that we have in the future editions, including Portuguese as well as Indian languages. Muito obrigado, Deo Bore Kurum. Now, Cielo, I'll leave you the, all the, the time that you need to, to make introductory remarks about this book release. Uh, thank you, Delphine. Thank you, Paul. I'm sharing my slides. Can you see them? Yes. See. Si. Okay. Yes, the slides are ready, so I, I will get started. Is that fine, Delphine and Paul? Okay. So here I go. So first of all, I would like to thank Paul and Delphine for today, for this launch and being able to participate. And to all the friends who are here present, uh, in Goa, in Sao Paulo, in Portugal, in the United States, in different places. So in plurilingual and multicultural societies, 
the languages in power change through time. And this deeply affects literary spaces, which are forever subject to change. Well, this is the case of India, and this is the case of Goa. The heyday of the Portuguese language in Goa, as you very well know, was during the 19th and first half of the 20th century. Though only a small percentage of the population could speak and write in English, still Portuguese, unlike English, can be considered, as argued by Sandra Taí de Lobo, 2014, the mother tongue of many Goans, in my extension, a Goan language. As Ataí de Lobo goes on to affirm, this was due to two reasons. The first, the role in the promotion of Portuguese language and culture during the colony. And the second, the use of Portuguese as the language of knowledge in different fields, among them literature. During this period, literary works in Portuguese, mainly short stories and poems, but also novels, were published by Goan authors who had Portuguese as their mother tongue. In fact, the novel Los Brahmanes, 1866, by Francisco Luis Gomez, could be claimed as one of the first Indian novels, as says the Indian writer Aravind Adia. Due to the limited readership and the small number of publishing houses in Goa, Short stories, poems, and serialized novels were published in some of the main Goan dailies, like O Heraldo, Today Herald, in Panjim, and A Vida in Margaon, among several others. With the end of the Portuguese presence in Goa and its integration into India, Portuguese lost its place in Goa for being a European language and the language of the colonizer, paradoxically to English another European and colonial language, but of wider reach and closely associated with the work market. Though as Frederick Noronha observes in his PhD thesis, nowadays many books in Portuguese are cataloged in the rare book section at Central Library in Panjim, Goan literature in Portuguese has not died out in Goa. One of the legacies of the 400 years of Portuguese presence in Goa is a visible literary body in the Portuguese language. And to confirm this, look at my slide. I invite you to read Paul Melu Castro's book, Lengthening Shadows, a compilation of short stories in Portuguese, also translated into English and published by Frederick Noronha, and A House of Many Mansions, another anthology of Goan literature in Portuguese, translated into English also by Paul and published by Leonard Fernandes. With the dethroning of Portuguese, or what the dethroning of Portuguese made even more visible, is that in a plurilingual community like the Goan and the Indian, a language is never autonomous, but it is intricately related at a linguistic, cultural and economic level to the other languages of the community. Today, Goan literature in the Portuguese language lives on through literary criticism, as the aim of literary critics is to see this literature become part of the field of literatures in the Portuguese language around the world, through the migration of topics such as life in colonial Goa and its aftermath, common in Goan literature in Portuguese, into literary works in English, Konkani, as well as Marathi, through the translation of literary works in Portuguese, mainly into English, and hopefully into Konkani and Marathi, to reach wider audiences in Goa and to become part of Indian as well as world literature. But most important, to allow Goans who today are not proficient in Portuguese to have the chance to reconnect with one of the traditions of their own literatures in translation. And I dare say that this is one of the main aims of Paul's efforts. Indra Nath Choudhury, 1997, points out that in India, there is unity of literary expression despite linguistic varieties. <clears throat> 
What actually acts as a link among all these languages, argues the author, is not the imposition of a single language or favoring some languages in detriment of others, but the translation of works from one language into another, actually contributing to encouraging an elaborate pattern of interregional, interethnic communication. Also for G and Devi 1997, literature in translation is more the norm than the exception in India. He adds that all Indian narratives can be considered as selves, can be considered as selves that do not exist independently, but as part of an all-encompassing self. In other words, in India in general, and Goa in particular, are plurilingual. There is not one literary tradition, but many that are deeply intertwined as narratives in one language and tradition are rewritten and translated into the many others. I would like to think that narratives from Goa in the Portuguese language compose one of the many selves of Indian literature and live on also through translation. Paul Melui Castro is presenting today his translation of two of the finest books of short stories by two Goan women writers, Vivencia Partilladas, 2004, as well as Maria Sadahoshas and published short stories in the book, Life Stories, the Short Stories of Maria Sadahosha. And Monsoon, 1963, Monsoon, 2019 by Vimala Devi. Both anthologies are short story cycles. From different contexts, Vimala Devi wrote the stories in Goa, but published them in Portugal, while Maria Sadahosha wrote and published them in Goa. <clears throat> and different perceptions of the Portuguese regime Devi was ambivalent about the Portuguese colonial government in Goa, while Rocha saw it as a paternalistic regime. Both writers delve into Goa's life in the final years of the Portuguese presence and its aftermath, and with great artistry depict conflicts and points in common across Goan social divide. For the introduction to the recently released anthology, The Greatest Goan Stories Ever Told, 2022, Manu Harshetti, the editor, gave the voice to the translators in the introduction. Says Paul Melui Castro about his own translations. I really don't try to improve on the original. I don't think that's my place. I see my translations as more documentary than instrumental. That is to say, I'm trying to show something from the past rather than create my own text out of pre-existing materials. <clears throat> I have a great admiration for Paul's works, really. I think I have read all of his translations to date. And I think that though, as he says, he does not improve on the original. In his desire to show something from the past, he does it in a faultless, impeccable manner. So I believe that G. N. Davis' observations applies to Paul's translations when he says that the translated text should not be seen as synonymous of the original, but as the revitalization of the original in another verbal and temporal space because plot, stories, and characters gain new life in the new version of the narrative. Precisely, this is the case with Paul's translations of Vivencias Partilladas and Monsoon, in which, <clears throat> with a linguist precision and a fiction writer's artistry, he masterfully brings back to life, in the English language, the Goa so finely depicted in these two great Goan literary works in the Portuguese language. Obrigada, de Voricorum, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Cielo. Muito obrigado, obrigadinho. Uh, now, Paul, you have the... Okay, great. Um, Thanks very much, Delphine. Um, so I didn't want to belabor my, my thanks, but just before getting started, 
I wanted to show my gratitude in, in more or less chronological order to, to Cielo for coming up with the idea of having this launch and being one of the sort of movers and shakers in organizing it. Um, to Delphi for uh, receiving the idea and, and, and making it happen. Um, and, to, uh, and to friends sort of near and far for being here, either in presence or virtually. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of launch myself, as well as my book, um, into what I was going to say. So um, translation in the Western tradition is associated with loss, with a falling away from the true original word. From the well-known Italian quip, traduttore, traditore, which, with sincere apologies for my Italian pronunciation, frames translators as betrayers, to the monolingual poet Robert Frost's observation, often bandied about far beyond the scope of the Americans' concerns, that, as everybody knows, poetry is what is lost in translation, which tars the transposer as a sort of cultural vandal. Here I want to strike a balance. I want to think first off about what we gain in translation, um, namely, uh, most importantly, new readers and new readings. Um, Translation, I argue, is best described as a sort of third thing, not a work in a foreign tongue, but also not a work originally written in the target language. It is, in some ways then, both an original and a copy, and as such can reveal much about relations between the languages and cultures it, it involves. Yet, not being Pollyanna-ish by nature, an understanding that translation takes place within our concrete world, um, that is to say, in a space of hierarchies and inequalities, I do recognize a danger of loss, which Delphi alluded to in his introduction. Just not necessarily the semantic or aesthetic insufficiently recurrently associated with the practice of translation. Um, a discussion of this danger will form my conclusion. But first, let me say a few words about the two works that bring me here today. I don't know if it's possible to show the, um, to show the, the slides. Um, they don't add a lot to what I'm saying, but they're useful as, a, um, as an orientation point. So um, the first is Monsoon, which I have here, um, my version of Vimala Devi's Monsoon. Um, in the translation, it's a collection of 16 stories that portray the Goa Devi left behind when she moved to Portugal in 1958. A Goa stitched together along scenes of caste, class, and religion. Now, um, I think we can sort of move past the first image, which just sort of attracted me for this sort of equation of translation with copying, um, but it's, it's not important. If we go along to the next, um, the next slide along. Um, so this, is, this shows something that we've seen a little bit already. So we have Vimala Devi and her work in, tra in translation and in the original. Now, the first Portuguese edition was published in 1963. It's important to say that my translation is of the 2003 edition, um, which was the second augmented edition which included three more stories than the original. Um, as I've argued elsewhere, um, successive length perhaps, um, these extra narratives decisively change the way the collection works as a cycle, um, by which I mean the way in which the stories work cumulatively and not simply on an individual level. I think Cielo spoke very well about this, both in relation to um, Monsal and in relation to Roche's work. Just to give an example of how the second edition radically changes um, how Monsal works. Uh, in the second edition, the first story involves somebody who leaves Goa to seek their fortune elsewhere, namely in Bombay, whereas the final story involves somebody coming back from Lisbon to Goa, which is obviously a, a symbolic movement, to remake their life in Goa and sort of proleptically in this post-Portuguese space. Um, the first version doesn't have that last story, so it works in a very different way. Um, you know, what's interesting about the, the second edition is the cycle turns full circle. Now, whenever you see this, um, these stories referred to, you'll generally see a reference to this first edition. This is the first edition, which I believe is in the library here. I don't know how many of the second editions, which were done on a far smaller scale in 2003, um, and didn't circulate as widely as the first one. So I don't know how widely available they are. Um, and that's an important point to, if you like, recall, because I'll return to it later. Um, let me move on to the second work. So the second work I'm talking about today, released this week, is Life Stories by Maria Elster Rocha, where Debbie recreated Goa from afar. Um, so if you can move on to the second slide, just to 
So where we have the, the kind of the two versions here, although yeah, they're not exactly two versions. And I'll say something about this now. Um, where Devi recreated Goa from afar, Rosha wrote more about the world around her, a couple of historical stories aside. In her work, we see a Goa that goes beyond the colonial, literally so in one particular tale set in 1961, which captures that moment of transition. Um, a good example of the sort of new Goa that comes through in her stories um, are the set of narratives about newly arrived teachers of Marathi, um, and obviously post-colonial development, um, though their lives parallel to an extent um, the life of Rosha, whose career as a Portuguese teacher took her all over the former Stad of the Indian. Uh, a signal difference also is geographical imagination, where Devi takes characters to Lisbon and to Rio de Janeiro, Rosha's narratives take in Bombay and Daman. Yet despite these, difference, these differences, um, the concerns that preoccupy Rosha are held in common with Devi, concerns of poverty, injustice, identity, class, gender, I think we can start to see how in analyzing or picking out analytically these categories, we start to have a basis on which we can make broader comparisons, both within Portuguese and outside of Portuguese. Um, and as I shall argue, that's something which um, I think is very important to happen in Goa, and which I hope that these translations can bring a small contribution. Now, I said that um, Life Stories isn't exactly a translation of Vivensis Partidadas. What do I mean by that? Um, it's true that the Vences Partilhadas came out in 2003 um, through Oscar Noronha's third millennium, in, millennium imprint. Um, and I can't stress enough here how, without this initiative on the part of Oscar in bringing these stories out, um, I think Russia's stories would have been lost. Right? It was this um, publication, this individual initiative on his part, which preserved these stories for posterity. Um, now, later I want to talk a little bit about a, um, a sort of dire concept within literary studies of the great unread. Um, it can be quite, a, I mentioned it to Frederick um, the other day and he said it sounded very, very depressing. And in a way it is very depressing. Um, but what I would like you to remember is um, this example of Vivencius Partidades and the way in which Oscar resuscitated these stories. So one of the things I'm going to want to argue is that although this, this idea of the great unread exists, um, stories can always be um, salvaged, um, as long as they're, they're, that, that kind of a sort of a base level of the material has been preserved. Now, what's um, where uh, life stories expands on Vivensis Partidades. Vivensis Partidades has fourteen stories, um, but this collection has six stories that feature or that featured in the Portuguese language press, but which weren't anthologized, and another six stories that Rocha wrote but never published. Um, so again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later as well, but I mean, I think here we see on a very practical level how sometimes um, the kind of editorial work that translation and anthologization involves can sometimes bring a greater coherence to originals. Uh, and in, in a situation where the original is fragile, that can, that can, yeah, that can have the kind of danger, which I think um, Delphine alluded to at the beginning. But for the, for, but for the moment, let me talk a little bit about positive things about what's found in translation to return to my title. Um, so let me address what I think I have gained in translating monsoon and life stories from my own personal viewpoint as a translator. Um, as uh, has been mentioned already, my day job is as a lecturer at Glasgow in um, comparative literature. A lot of my research is consequently in the field of literary criticism, the bedrock of which I think is the closest and most careful reading possible of a text. So it's quite simple really although in practice it can, be, it can be more difficult than that. Now, in my opinion, translation is one, is one of, if not the most, attentive, painstaking way we can read. Indeed, the translator Daniel Hahn, who is one of the um, most prominent contemporary translators from English into Portuguese into English, um, and at least in Britain, a well-known commentator on, transla on translation, has described translation very well, and I think with a nice simplicity as, um, precise and careful reading, followed by precise and careful writing. And I think it's this notion of care and the sort of, if I can call it this, slow responsibility it implies, that is one of the great boons of translation. So what do I mean by care and slow responsibility? I mean that unlike other readers, translators cannot skip any words or passages they don't understand. And if you, if you think about the, the, the normal um, experiential reading of, of works, 
you know, if we're reading for pleasure, if we're reading casually, we come up against something that we don't understand. We just kind of skip ahead. Um, that's a luxury that's unavailable to the translator. If there's something in the story, we have to do something with that thing, right? We have to, and, and there are several people in the room have been have been on the wrong end of me saying, I don't understand this, please help. So my, one of my go-to um, things to do when I find these uh, un, uh, difficult to understand things is to consult people who know better. But um, let me give an example of um, something which tripped me up in a text and which I spent a fair amount of time trying to unravel. Um, in Devi's story, Teater, so one of the stories which comes up in, I think, both editions of Monsoon, um, one amateur player in a, uh, in a, a, a teater, so this folkloric um, go and theater form, um, is described as a polkishta. Um, in my extreme innocence, when I first encountered the text, I think it was sometime in 2007, I think I took this to mean literally that somebody was actually dancing a polka. And I think people at No Teatro are going to see how ridiculous that idea is. Um, when I later consulted the author, uh, this ludicrous idea had her in stitches, and she explained it was just being used ironically. But this left me with a problem, what to do with this word, right? Um, polka dancer, I think, in English would just lead at least unwary readers to the same mistake I was making. So what, you know, what would I do this? Um, in the end, um, my solution, uh, and I'll give it here, <laughs> hopefully it's not a bad one, although if you disagree, feel free to take it up with me at the end. Um, my solution was to use the Konkanized form, polkith, I think is used in Konkani, which derives from this. Um, so it kind of, if you like, it both preserves the ambiguity of the original and it, it preserves the address of the original, but I think without making this kind of idea of, being a literal polka dancer too, um, too obvious. Now, um, uh, work that didn't exist when I was doing the translation, which has just come out now by Ananya Kabir. It's a wonderful piece of work, which looks at how um, the Mandor arri arises from um, a kind of, I think what she calls a sort of transoceanic process of, um, process of influences. And she has in this work a kind of a long discussion of one of the particular mandors, which you know refer to the flower seller and the polka dancer, the polkist. So, um, although that wasn't there when I was um, doing the translation, if anybody is interested in kind of following up where the irony that or the sarcasm, actually more than irony, that Devi is employing, um, if anybody's interested in following that up, I, I would suggest Kabir's work. So um, in any case, this quite long-winded quest for the translation of one pesky word is an example of the, this kind of slow care I think a translator must take, and which also feeds into a comprehensive understanding of the text. You know, it kind of feeds into the way in which we have to pick out the words as threads and kind of see what we can, what we can find. And of course, that brings translation very close to um, literary criticism. So again, one way of formulating what we're doing with translation is as a very, very intimate form of literary criticism. Now, at the same time, I don't wish um, to imply that no words can ever be left out of a translation. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've pushed, always pushed back against ideas of bilingual editions. I think they work very poorly because um, they just encourage, if you like, a sort of um, hunt for the missing word. Um, whereas I think that judicious omission is a secret art of translation. Um, one at which ac academic translation, translators tend to be particularly bad. But any omission that we do do has to be deliberate. Um, and if meaning is excised, it has to be compensated or recovered somewhere else. Now, one thing that translation does, um, in the opinion of Susan Bassnett, is to reveal the asymmetries between languages, the sort of asymmetry we saw in the, in the example I just gave. Another broader aspect that reveals these asymmetries is the extent to which any given translation um, displays itself as such. A long-standing opposition in studies of translation is between covert and overt translation. So translations which, if you like, pretend not to be translations and translations which wear their translated status on their sleeve. Uh, I think what's interesting is how what we might call post-colonial texts and post-colonial translations um, show the limitations of these classical ideas which are based on the idea of translation as between two homogenous discrete cultural blocks, between one side and another side. You know, what 
different sides will be really think of these originals in Portuguese and these translations in English as occupying. As well as the insufficiencies of theories that basically envisage the exchange of books between European nation states, what translation reveals or what it finds in Devi and Roche's texts is the translational work in which the originals themselves are based. What I mean by this is that the majority of um, Roche and Devi's stories are about people and situations that are not themselves Lucifer. In both cases, the authors already had to make linguistic adjustments to write their stories in Portuguese, to encompass idioms and the lexis of material culture, social structure, and national conditions. In the classic terms of the Belgian translation theorist André Lefebvre, there has already been an alignment of an outside linguistic grid with a Goan conceptual grid. These adjustments take different strategies. Devi's adjustments are so naturalized, they fit within what is basically standard literary Portuguese, which made her translation fairly straightforward. Any remaining issues were cleared up by translating the glossary that, that accompanied the original. And I think it's interesting to think about this notion of literary works, including glossaries. Um, within sort of uh, a kind of a classic idea of literature, there's no room for glossaries. You know, it's this kind of integration of a certain um, textual architecture taken from anthropology and brought into literature. And again, I think the, the way in which that always that also or that already presupposes readers on different sides, um, you know, immediately starts to show where um, these kind of insufficiencies in, tra in classical translation ideas um, can be found. Now, um, at the same time, what particularly interested me um, was how it was only when some elements of Portuguese as it was spoken in Goa um, crept into Devi's stories that they really became trickier to translate. In the story Esperanza or Hope, a character describes a grand family in the following terms. Conhecem pessoas grandes todas de Panji, which I found very um, difficult to translate without flattening or caricature. I'd suggest it is when literature stages a dialectical or dialectal, not dialectical, or dialectal or sociolectal relations within a language um, that translation falls down because the particular configuration of these internal relations is unique. It's relatively easy to move from standard language to standard language. Idiomatic expression is an entirely different story, mainly because every vernacular is marked in different ways um, to its standard. What I've meant to say here is that to an extent, both Devi and Rosha had already wrangled with the problem of Europhone representation. So I followed their lead. The limits of the authors came up against perhaps Bessine and Rosha. In some of her stories, there are whole snatches of dialogue in Konkani. Moments then in which she spilt over her chosen linguistic medium. In one story, for example, the particular word used for dog marked the speaker out as Hindu. This sort, um, this sort of thick cultural detail is impossible in English or Portuguese unless provided um, editorially, which risks the text sounding didactic and marring the aesthetics, the aesthetics of the original. Um, my solution here was to use footnotes. So again, this other importation from a, a non-literary um, um, kind of register. So this makes the translation significantly different to the originals, which bore no footnotes, um, particularly those published in the press. Um, and this shows a very different um, situation of publication between Rocha and Devi. So Rocha was writing in Lisbon, already thinking about how her stories could address a non-Goan audience, Russia, um, Russia writing in the Goan press was essentially writing for an audience which was exactly bilingual in the same measure that she was. There was no need to translate because people could skip back and forward between the two languages in the same way that she was doing. Um, and also, um, and they could skip back and forward in a way of which I was simply not capable. And again, I extend thanks to people in the room who helped me decipher what, these, um, what, these, uh, what this dialogue meant. So the sort of footnotes I've included in, um, in Russia both open up the text to a different readership, um, but do kind of have the effect of weighing them down slightly. So again, we sort of see here a, a, a kind of a profit and loss balance sheet um, you know, in the way in which Russia's mixing of languages without cushioning is faithful to context, but opaque to a non-going readership. Um, how am I doing time, Bill? Okay.
So now what these reflections prompted by translation suggest are the different expressive capacities of Europhone and Indian regional li literatures, and perhaps some of the difficulties facing translations, the translators of those literatures, and some of the barriers to their circulation beyond an immediate readership. Um, I recently read Jerry Pinto's translation of the Marathi Dal Dalek classic, When I Hit When I Hid My Case, when I hit, sorry, When I Hid My Cast by Babu Rao Bagul, which I admired greatly. It's very, very good work. But I must admit that vast swathes of the book passed me by. But I just didn't share the frame of reference of Bagel's implied reader. Unlike a, lot, unlike a lot of classic Anglophone Indian literature, this really wasn't a work that performed its own interpretation for the reader to follow. Accessibility, as well as some abstract notion of quality, controls circulation. So looking at a set of literatures in and between languages, and I think Goa is an absolutely fundamental case study for this, allows us to reflect on what can and cannot be easily included in various linguistic mediums. So to give an example of something which um, I had great difficulty in including in the English translations I've been doing, um, is the vocabulary related to the Catholic Church. So what to do, for instance, in stories where confrades dressed in opas y mursas, who are members of the Fabrica de Igreja, circulate. Now, it's not that there aren't ways of saying this in English, but there aren't very, these tend to be sort of more link, more long-winded ways of saying it, which is fine if we're writing history or fine if we're writing kind of social um, narratives, but in um, a literary text, which needs to be, especially a short story, which needs to move fast on the ground, you know, there isn't space to give these kind of long-winded um, explanations. So yeah, I think it's no accident on this um, on this point that one area where the Portuguese language still seems to appear prominently in in in, in contemporary Goan life is is the church. Now, um, translation does not merely produce new readings for the translator; otherwise, it would be quite a solipsistic affair. Translation part participates in what um, the German theorist Walter Benjamin called the afterlife of the text. So, what happens after the text has lived? It multiplies the potential readers of a work, multiplies the potential readings, uh, and so increases the odds that a particular work won't sink into the sad category, here I re return to what I said at the beginning, of the great unread. This idea that 99% of the, of the books ever published um, kind of lie unread today. I mentioned this idea, to, I meant, as I said, I mentioned this idea to Frederick the other day. He commented that it sounded like an incredibly sad notion. In a way it is. But there is an upside, which is that any book which is findable can be resuscitated. It can be republished, it can be reread, it can be recriticized, it can be put into circulation again. And I think this is a really important, um, important thing to do. So again, um, let's look at let's think about the, the fate of Vivensis Partidadas and the stories which are in life stories, which are sort of gone from, if you like, being forgotten in a dusty drawer to being resuscitated in Portuguese to now having the potential to circulate at least for a while in English. Um, so here, uh, moving towards the end, I would like to consider um, some of the reactions to my translation of Monsoon. This came out a couple of years ago. There's been a sort of time for people to read and to comment on it. Um, Andre Lefebvre coined the expansive term refractions to include in a single category all the processing of literature which keeps it alive, whether that be reading, translation, literary criticism or historiography. Now, the more refractions there are, the more a work lives because anybody that wants to um, then refract that work themselves has to engage with a complex field of reception. Uh, and I think now what's interesting about these new responses to Monsoon is that anybody who wants to read Monsoon is going to have to grapple with them in order to, um, in order to make new points. Uh, and now, um, yeah, one reading that particularly interest me, interested me is that exemplified by Jason Fernandes and Selma Carvalho, who both discerned a compatibility in Monsoon with Indian nationalist ideas, something which I have to say I'd never seen. Carvalho writes, and I quote, persistently Devi prioritizes India over Goa as the more progressive and aspirational nation state. I was quite taken aback. I'd always thought the opposite, to be honest. Um, perhaps I thought to myself, reading this, this was an example of Lawrence Venuti's point that translations always make possible domesticated meanings, by which he understands meanings generated in the context of reception 
um, not meanings encoded in the work in the context of production. Now, um, I take what Fernandes and Carvalho referred to, or wanted to refer to, wanted to criticize, was how um, Devi, wanting to criticize her own Catholic community in colonial Goa, created some idealized Hindu characters. Um, we might think, for example, of the progressive Dr. Monka in Job's Children, who doesn't really have a Catholic counterpart in the stories. Um, this uh, reaction on the part of um, Fernandes and Carvalho, and the way in which it stands in contradistinction to original or existing readings, um, brings up new questions that we have to answer. You know, how do we read such characters as a Moncard against the background of the competing nationalisms that tussled over Portuguese Goa? How do we read them today when the relation of Goa to these discourses has shifted so fundamentally? Monsoon, I think, has sharpened the need to consider how we receive Monsoon in the present day. Whether we agree with Fernandes and Carvalho's points or not, we now need to peg our own reaction to both past and present contexts, um, which I think will help ensure the survival of Debbie's work. Um, the other reaction that interested me, I wanted to bring here today, came from the Good Reads website, where someone took issue with Debbie's use of Dravidian uh, as an adjective. Um, this anonymous critic wrote, he or she, wrote sounding both puzzled and irked, and I quote, Dravidian faces describe Shudra fisher folk, for instance. I can never understand what that means. Are Dravidians all supposed to be dark? Are they supposed to sport specific features? Or is the Dravidian tag supposed to indicate some sort of caste identity? Um, this reader felt the adjective used, but currently by Devi, to be both outmoded and prejudiced. Now, this observation compels us to think a little bit about how Devi's own idiosyncratic take on the Aryan invasion myth gives her a vocabulary to express sympathy for Goa's downtrodden. On her, in, on her implicit view, the Gaunkars of Goa were not the original beneficiaries of Parashurama's arrow, but rather incoming usurpers who displaced and set up a, a hierarchy of what she calls the Dravidians of Goa, the various non-dominant caste figures who populate the stories of Monsal uh, and who are described with this adjective. Um, I think it rather complicates how we understand Devi as post-colonial. It's a really interesting point this reader um, raised. But the question that it prompts us to ask, and which you know, we're going to revitalize, I think, revitalize criticism of the, of the text, what do we do today with this attempt to put a progressive spin on such an invidious myth? How do we handle this sort of prejudice, anti-prejudice? Again, here, translation, by producing new reactions by new readers, poses new and vital questions, revitalizing a text. So um, I'll conclude quickly um, with what I believe are some potential losses in translation. And this speaks to some of what Delphine said in his introduction. Translation always wrestles with ethical questions of appropriation. Is it a speaking for, a speaking with, or simply a speaking over? This ethical question here has a particularly concrete manifestation. In short, there is a real danger that these English translations displace the Portuguese originals. Devi's works um, are out of print, um, as I said, uh, and, and also as I mentioned at the beginning, this sort of second edition circulated far less widely than the first edition. Uh, and I think it's the second edition which is particularly the important one. So um, at least in market terms, uh, at, the, at the moment at least, my translation has a, a, a kind of a much greater scope and a much greater circulation. Um, and so it's accessible with far less effort than the original. Uh, Rocha's case, as I described, is slightly different. I think there are still plenty of copies of events which part of the others in, in existence. I think Oscar has lots of copies, but they don't really circulate very much. Um, in preparing this talk, I looked on WorldCat, so the, the kind of aggregation catalog of um, holdings in worldwide universities. And at least, although it's, it does skew very Anglo-American, according to WorldCat, there are only three universities worldwide listed as holding uh, Vivensis Partidades, um, all of which are in the UK, um, two of which I previously taught at and deposited the book myself, one of which a colleague teaches at who I gave a copy of the book to. Um, I did a search on the Biblioteca Nacional in Lisbon, uh, and sometimes it's a, it, it can be a complicated search engine, um, but if what my if I did search correctly, um, that came up a blank. So I mean, it seems like uh, you know there's this this kind of difference between this book, which is circulating the life stories, which is circulating quite widely, the Vences Partilhadas, which hasn't at least as far as I could see reached 
um, Portugal's most important deposit library. So again, the real, dif the real difficulty or the real danger here is that the, um, the afterlife of these works could be exclusively or um, mostly in English. So um, I wanted to say a couple of final words about a couple of translations that are coming out later. So I think it's the next, if you wouldn't mind, Delphi. Um, so this displacement seems perhaps an unavoidable consequence. Later this year, I have two more translations coming out. One of which is of Conto Rujinaish by Augusto Rosario Rodrigues, and one of which is of the collected stories of Epitacio Paes. Now, as far as I know, the only extant copy of Rodrigues' stories, um, to which I'm indebted to Rud for pointing out to me when I visited the library many years ago, um, the only extant copy, I think, is in the central library, which means that this is a very fragile book. You know, a book in which only one copy that we know of, or two copies we know of, exists, is in a very fragile state. Um, as for uh, Paij, the situation is similar to Rosha. Of the 23 stories in translation, 13 were included in this work, which was released in Lisbon, which is long out of print, which is at least Another 10 of the stories which are going to feature in the, in the translation either appeared in the newspaper or were unpublished in the author's lifetime. So again, for Paij, as for Rosha, the, the afterlife, um, the uncirculated work may well be mainly an anglophone phenomenon uh, and in the syncratic example of what the american george steiner calls um, certain translations betrayal by augment um now uh you know i think another thing that's worth pointing out quickly is that go and literature in portuguese was almost exclusively an unedited phenomenon um one of the things that I've come to feel is that the global inequality of literature is nowhere more apparent than in editing, by which I mean the input into the finishing of works by more than just the author. Um, authors who are fated, whose work is widespread, receive much more input, input into the construction of their works than their unsung peers. Um, I'm not sure about Devi, but certainly Grosha, Pais and Rodrigues, the only people it seems that kind of shaped their work were them. Um, in the passage from their originals to the English translation, I, while I haven't, as, as, um, as Cielo said at the beginning, I, I try to refrain from what we might call improvements, but I certainly tidy up aspects of the, of the work, um, tidy up things like um, errors of reference, tidy up things like characters changing name in the middle of the stories, kind of little kind of um, moments when the author takes the eye off, their eye off the ball, which are very easy to do. Um, this means, um, unfortunately, but perhaps unavoidably, that in a sense, translations are more polished than originals. Now, the final issue I want to address here is what to do with these translations. The Israeli translation scholar Itamar Ibn Zohar has observed that translations are seldom incorporated into the historical account in any coherent way. How might these translations fit into an ongoing construction of Goan literature, even Indian literature? There is, I think, an obvious benefit the Goan readers and writers have a capacious understanding of the literary past. What themes have been tackled? What ideas and ideologies articulated? With what strengths? And importantly, with what weaknesses? What I consider necessary, which I've broached in a superficial way here, is think about Goan literature in the context of current debates on translation and comparative literature. Given the heterogeneous nature and history of Goa, which brings together different languages, different cultures, different historical positions and situations, it should be a natural place for this. Although to be honest, I'm not aware of um, a lot of activity in these fields. Um, I wanted to just bring my um, talk to a conclusion with uh, a quote from um, the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne um, from his essay on cannibals. He observed, there is as much difference between us and ourselves as between us and others. And I think this is an observation that might well orient comparative literature and translation studies both in Goa and elsewhere. So what I hope, and I hope this will be the effect of these, um, these books, um, what I hope, what I think is that the potential of translation is that it, even, if it, even as it offers an insight into others, it might also tell us a little bit about ourselves, wherever we might be. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for your amazing lesson on literary translation uh, and also the importance of having uh, this kind of uh, books translated to English um, in order to reach much more people, much more readers. Uh, English, I think that everybody agrees with me, is not a vaccine against Portuguese language. On the contrary, it's more a strategy to reach more and more people. Well, now, uh, since uh, we we are a little a bit, um, um, I have to do uh, many things at the same time, but I think I can manage. Uh, in Portugal, uh, our friends, they are probably thinking about having your, their lunch. In Brazil, maybe they are planning to have their sort of second, second time the Café da Manhã. And here we are probably thinking about the, our Alugubi um, or the Cafrial, because time is running very fast. Anyway, uh, I would like to <clears throat> now to, to ask if someone here or those who are uh, watching us on the Zoom, uh, if you have a question, mainly and especially for our guest, Paul Melkavar, Melwikash. Confusing me. Well, okay. it's not an excuse, but I left my, my house, Portugal, Sunday, three o'clock early morning, and I reached yesterday, seven o'clock. Uh, early morning ago, uh, and I hardly slept since then. But anyway, uh, so if you have questions also, I can answer to any question if you want to ask me, but basically, but mostly uh, two or three questions to Paul, Ellie Castro. You have come, come a little, uh, a little close to the bus. Um, Amal Shan Barbaza, while uh, translating Elsa Rocha's uh, stories, have you retained the use of Konkani or have you tried to translate that into English? Uh, what I, so, um, so there, there are different levels of Konkani in the stories. So there's some stories which don't have any. And there's some stories which um, you get, start to get whole snatches of dialogue in Konkani, which was impossible for me to understand. And I really relied on people helping me. Um, I think it's worth saying a little bit about the context in which she was writing. So she was writing for the newspaper Avida, which was a Portuguese language newspaper, which um, kind of survived transition. But I, 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 and I don't know enough about the internal debate. In 67, 68, um, it decided to stop writing in Portuguese and switch to Konkani. So if you like, um, uh, and I think it merged with, a diff with another newspaper, I'm not sure how long it survived, but certainly within it, what's interesting to look back is how the kind of the progressive entry of Konkani into her stories reflects a discussion about what the proper, or what the most convenient language to be used is. In direct answer to your question, um, what was complicated was that um, obviously Russia was a, a fluent speaker of Konkani, but the way in which she wrote Konkani was often um, a sort of phonetic form using some kind of aspects of Portuguese. I think quite different from the way in which Konkani would be written today. So what I did is I kept the Konkani as it was on the, on the, on the argument that for any um, contemporary speaker, it would be comprehensible, but it would also be a link to the past. And what I did with help of people who spoke, who speak, not to speak Konkani better than me, who speak Konkani, um, I included footnotes which translated them into English. And as I said, there's, a, there's a, an advantage and a disadvantage to that, because footnotes do weigh down a text quite a lot. And they kind of, if you like, they, they make a literary text look not a literary text. You know, they make it look like some kind of anthropological source. But um, you know, I, I, I took that trade off, thinking about the difference between her original context of publication, in which not only were the people writing, thinking about Portuguese and Konkani, but presumably all of the readers would also be more or less comfortable with the two registers. Yeah. In the dialogue where she uses the Konkani, I think she's done it deliberately because that is the way, manner in which many people who did speak Portuguese in the 70s and 80s did talk. They would start talking in Portuguese, add their Konkani words, go back to Portuguese. And I think that is still happening today. And if that is translated. I think we lose the flavor of the of the story totally. That is why I was asking the question. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I think hundred percent. I mean, what what I what I was sort of saying is there's this 
what, one of the big issues that we have is, I, is who, are we, who, are we, who are we writing for? Who is the reader, right? So, I mean, and that, that has to do with any, any work, right? So there's a tendency of works which um, have the ambition of reaching a wide readership, as I kind of mentioned in the, in the talk, to, if you like, to perform their own interpretation, to explain things. Um, Rosha wasn't doing that, right? So she was writing in a very different way to Debbie. So Debbie um, was writing in Lisbon, and although she has, she also has bits of Konkani, right? She has a, a, an extract from, I, I believe, the Lord's Prayer in Konkani. But what she says is she says, they said the Lord's Prayer in Konkani. So there's no need to kind of understand it because you can do, you can do the translation yourself. So in a way, it's a sort of slightly more exoticized use of Konkani to mark a sort of um, distance. Whereas, you know, as you're saying, it, it, what Russia was doing was in a sense representing a, a kind of a real life code switching. And I think it's interesting to say, I think it's Russia, you'll correct me, Frederick, is it Russia's niece who, is it Sonia Gom, do you see her niece? So there's a, a writer today, Sonia Gom, who if you like, I, I'm not sure she knew that much about Russia's stories, but you know, either deliberately or by sort of a process of serendipity, she's um, kind of followed up that way of writing. She has these kind of very intricate trilingual stories that go between English, Konkani and Portuguese, I think to represent the exact reality that, that, you're, that you're referencing. This is for Paul. This is for Paul. Uh, do you think that the, since you've been translating for quite a long while, the stories uh, reflect the ground reality uh, in Bombay or in other parts of India where a lot of the Goans have migrated because a few years ago when the well-known fashion designer Wendell Brodick was speaking at Xavier Center, he from this public podium made it clear that he said I was brought up in a chawl in Mahim and I had to spend 10 minutes with a water pail in my hand every morning to go to the toilet. And I, after the function, I asked him why he had made this because everyone likes to project a different lifestyle. And my reality was this, and most of the Goans living in some of the largest cities was not much different from mine. And that is why I brought it up because there was, a, there was this <laughs> feeling of anguish amongst the audience because you build up a certain uh, uh, narrative and his thing was going against. So how what do you think? Um, it's really it's a really interesting question. Um, so part part of the work that I would I would like to do next is to look at how how Bombay is represented in these stories, and it is represented in a couple of Russia's stories. My feeling, um, and again, it's interesting this question about how how accurate the context is. It's one of the strange things to translate from my point of view, in that I I know the stories very very intimately. Maybe I know the stories better than anybody but the authors. So I've kind of read them so much and looked at the words, but there is a kind of a gap between me and the context. Um, I don't know how well Russia knew Bombay. And there's certainly there's a, there's a tendency in, um, in go and writing to, at least go and writing in Portuguese, it's different in other languages. And then it, what's interesting is to see these sort of, uh, the contemporary works which have a nostalgic view of, um, the partly nostalgic view of Go and Bombay, like Jane Borge and some other people now. Um, generally, um, Bombay is seen as a sort of, you know, Goa is the kind of the small home, and Bombay is the place where Goans lose themselves. You know, and I, I think that's a particularly situated view of, um, if you like, a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a, a Go Goans that stayed at home. Um, now, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything as raw as um, the kind of testimony that Wendell Rodericks um, said. But in, in you know, there is there is a kind of there is a, a, a good description. What I think is a good description of a core in in Bombay, um, both in its positive and negative aspects. So both in terms of um, yeah, a, a, the 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 unease of life in those spaces, but also the, the kind of the community that was recreated there and the, 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 the way in which the people kind of looked out for each other. Um, so um, 
yeah, I think it's a very partial view of Bombay, but an interesting one. And what would be interesting, I think, um, and this is where I was, what I was trying to gesture to in, 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 my, um, in, my, in my talk, would be to bring together other Goan representations of Bombay uh, and to kind of work comparatively to see how language and social position and experience is producing different, um, different representations of that city. Uh, maybe even, you know, you could even expand that out into another project, which would be looking at how that, um, you know, how that relates to kind of other depictions of the city and other communities, whether they, whether, whether they align or, or diverge. Um, well, now I I think that it's time now to, to go to the third part of the, this event, not only book release, but uh, amazing and very interesting talk. Um, uh, so I, I would I would like to to ask first to start with the from with the students who who have prepared a um, few lines paragraph about uh, and some of them they are going to read in English, some of them are going to read in Portuguese. So uh, I would like us to open the, the this session for those who are um, um, following us on the, on Zoom. Um, so I would like to make a comment, Delphine. Uh, we'll start with the um, student from the uh, first year MA, Sibyl. I read a certo da um conto da Bimela Devi, titulado Incerteza. Diga-me cá, quando é o dote da sua filha, ela há de querer saber como deve compreender. O Sousa não se deixou desarmar. Ouvi um, um ruído à porta e reparou que a empregada entrava com dois refrescos e aproveitou o um momento para tossir longamente, como se alguma coisa lhe estivesse a aranhar a garganta. É um bom dote, pode estar descansado. Mas além do dote, a Angélica também leva outras coisas para um novo lar. Bem sabe que tem o um curso de piano e é uma boa dona da casa. Não é só uma mulher que se casa à espera de ter filhos. Isso agora. Depois, quando começam a ter crianças, esquece tudo. A única coisa realmente certa é o dote. Comentou o Silva tentando tirar importância aos estudos do piano. Obrigada. Um, we have some, we have some um, uh, friends of us. Uh, they, I think that uh, they want to read some uh, some uh, parts of, of the book, of the book, uh, life stories of uh, Monsoon, or maybe they have a question. Uh, I saw Adelaide. Adelaide. Yeah, switch on your microphone, please. Microphone, forward. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask Paul um, to develop the the idea. Oh, no that... Yes. Yes. Sim. Ou vai estamos, agora? Nós estamos ouvindo mas agora pode falar. Sim, Adelaide. Já posso? Ah, Já sim. posso. Uh, I would like Paul to develop the idea that for me it's uh, it's a bit. I never th uh, thought about it like that. To co the, to develop the idea that connects literary criticism with um, translation. In what way did that uh, happens? Yeah, so I think it's that idea that um, I think one of the 
a problem with some contemporary literary criticism is that it goes to, I think sometimes it goes, it, it goes kind of, it goes past the book too quickly. It goes mm. kind of past the book and kind of jumps into context, jump. And I think maybe perhaps especially in post-colonial criticism, you know, the book becomes okay. a way of a kind of a starting point to then, um, yeah, to then talk about history, to talk about sociology, to talk about, you know, talk about something else. Um, and I think what I, you know, what I personally think is that, um, you know, literary criticism has to start with the has to start with the text. It has to appreciate books for um, for their aesthetics, you know, for how they're working as short stories, how they're working as novels, and for all of the um, for all of the architecture of literature, um, kind of things to do with point of view, to do with um, metaphorics, to do with stylistics. Um, and I think, you know, if you translate a book, it's almost like it's almost like you're kind of taking, a, taking it apart and put, putting it back together again yourself. So you get this kind of, it, it's like you can, it's, it's sort of reading the book from the inside out, um, which I think is a, is a, is a good, um, yeah, is a good um, way of preventing that kind of too quick interpretation. You kind of, you have to go slowly. You know, I gave some examples of a couple of words where you can't just jump over them. You've got to think about not just what, and it becomes a more careful way of moving on to context because you're going through the details of the text rather than kind of using the text as a springboard you can just kind of jump off of. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think in, in, in a sense, it's that. It's, the, um, it's, beginning, it's beginning literary criticism with um, this very careful understanding of how the text works on its own terms and not just um, kind of looking to the text for what we want to get out of it, which I think happens, unfortunately, too easily sometimes. Okay, thank you, Paul. So we go, we come down again to Earth, to Goa. Now we'll invite now uh, Saloni to read a, a little bit from one of his. Hola, voy a leer um conto de Vimla Devi Fidelidad. Chandra canta teu un sorriso contrariado. Luisa continua a falar. 14 anos, meu Deus, não há direito. Não passa de uma criança. Que sabe uma rapariga aos 14 anos? Sabe uma coisa, pelo menos, murmurou Chandra canta. Uma coisa, continuar. Continua? Pergunta ela, frazindo a terceta e fitando o nos olhos. Há muitas coisas que não podes compreender, disse o rapaz. Ela estendeu uma perna, esticando bem a minha e largo a falar. Mas 14 anos, claro, não admira que andes por aí. Um casamento de seis não tem a razão de ser. Uh, nem sequer tiverão noite de núpcias não consumados. É, sumar é sumário. Sem complicações. Depois podemos tirar medicina tropical e irmos para a África. Não gostavas? Os dois fazíamos bom dinheiro. Chandra, Chandra. Obrigado, Salonia. Um, I think it's Sibel uh, uh, Cielo. Uh, you, you had your hand. You raise your hand. Now it's down. Do you want to say something or read some? No, no. I wanted to make a comment that Paul did a survey to see in what libraries he could find the books. So I don't know if there is a copy, if Elder perhaps knows better, of Vima Ladevi or Maria Sadahosha in Uspi. But although there are no copies of the book in, in the library, the students know the books because the elder taught a course on Goan literature and the students are very well acquainted with the two authors, aren't they, Elder? Elder, the microphone, please. Yes, we give, we give courses here uh, about uh, Goan literature in Portuguese. Paul uh, uh, was here once yes <laughs> give me a course too uh and um and okay yes and we circulate this in pdf and things like that in fact <laughs> but uh okay we we do it 
Also, my students at Universidad Federal de Tocantins, they are also acquainted with Vimala Devi, and one or two of the students publish uh, essays on Vimala Devi's book. So, so what I mean is that although the copies of the book might not be in the libraries, the many students, at least here in Brazil, they are acquainted with Vimala Devi's uh, works, and Maria Sadahosha too, in the Portuguese language, of course. Yeah, I think that's um I think it's I think that's that's great. Where um what I was thinking, we had um because if you in a in a sense, what that's producing is people who uh who you're sharing the work with, which is which is fantastic. What I was but what I was thinking more about was how um and this might be quite an academic thing, but how um people who don't know Devi or Rosha, how they discover it. So it was interesting. Um, Duarte and I have been uh, so Duarte Braga, a colleague of mine from um, from Portugal. So Duarte and I have been um, organizing a volume of um, essays, a, a journal um, volume of Luso Asian writing. Um, and we've had various kind of submissions from various parts of the world. A couple of people um, submitted from from America, and it was really interesting to see what they'd chosen to write about. And you see how, an extent, to an extent, what people, and this has to do with this idea of the great unread and the idea of the refractions, how what people end up writing about is partly depends on what they can find, right? So when they go to their library or when they search online, you know, what can they find? Um, and I think you know, it, it's very easy to spend other people's time and it's very easy to spend other people's money. And um, what would be great is if, these works, not just in Portuguese, but also Kigo and works in English and other kind of, and, and, and up, I mean, it's more difficult in Konkani or Marathi, but if they were in the main deposit libraries, so that when somebody becomes interested in something, they can sort of start searching, they can find it. Um, and it's probably worth saying a word here about how I first became interested in, in, in kind of go and writing. It was with Vimala Devi's A Literatura Indo Portuguesa. And one of the things about this work, so with putting the Portuguese, is this, this big two volume um, work that Devi and her husband, Manuel de Siabra, wrote in Portugal in the, in the early 1970s. And one of it is a, is a, a big essay that's not just about going literature, but also about going society, going history. And the second is this big anthology of going writing, which goes from, um, that goes from kind of decades, not decades, centuries back up until their present day. And what's interesting about this book is that almost every single research or academic research library in England has a copy, right? And like lots of people I know have become interested, have become interested because they've kind of searched and tried to find something and then found that copy. Um, and it's, and I guess what I was trying to say is that it's great that like you're, you're circulating these PDFs with students, but it, it, it's having holdings in the library which carries things forward into the future because PDFs disappear, right? I keep losing my I keep losing my own, stupidly enough. Um, it's true, it's true, absolutely true. So I will donate my copies to Uspi. Yeah. <laughs> well, once again, um, I don't know if there's any other, any other question from those who are not my right. I ask you to be able to sit on the left, look up the camera, and anyway, we can do some gymnastics. And, uh, any question or anyone wants to read uh, short text? Yes, Becca. Hello. 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 Uh, uh, there's a there so that there's a really a really difficult question but a really good question um and it's one i'm grappling with at the moment um because the, the, the work that brought me here was precisely um a go and author from the 1920s and that does kind of give you the how, which language do you translate into um you know do you try to sort of do a pastiche of past language and in a way that produces a hostage to fortune. It's how well you can pastiche you know, an English of 100 years ago uh, without anachronisms, without all sorts of 
difficulties? Or do you translate it into a very, very modern idiom, risking a kind of a, an inverse sort of anachronism, right? Somebody sounding like they're kind of dressed like me today rather than in a kind of top hat and tails in the 1920s. Um, I think in a sense, what you do with historical language is what you have to do with um, dialects and sociolects. I think that, that is, I think, one of the places where there's a kind of flattening in translation, where you have to try to get a neutral language that doesn't sound like it's from today, but also doesn't sound like it's necessarily been from before. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the things, one of the, the interesting things about translation is that um, translations age in a way that originals don't. So we keep doing translations, right? That's why you, if you think about something like um, the great Greek, great Greek classics, there have been every generation seems to translate it for themselves. So each generation has the need for a, a, an accessibility to that text. Whereas, you know, nobody translates Shakespeare into modern English. If they do, well, maybe they do, but I'm not sure how it works. I mean, there is that idea that the original is a kind of historical doc document that doesn't evolve, whereas the translation has to be redone. Um, so yeah, I think the, 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 the short answer is there's not an easy, um, there's not an easy answer. Uh, I sometimes think of translation as a little bit like that circus trick where there's lots of plates spinning. You've got to try to keep as many plates spinning as you can, but always a couple fall off. Just hope, they, just hope they don't all crash to the ground and, and smash the smithereens. Thank you. Um. Well, it's uh, our friends from Portugal there. Oh, yeah, I'd like she's still um, skipping the, the lunch. <laughs> um, so I propose if nobody else wants to read. Um, so I will request now um, another student from Go University. By the way, Go University, ours, all the students, our students, they are Indian students. There's no Goans or, or Goans and non Goan students. They are all Indian students. Some of them, they were born in Goa and they live in Goa for at least 20 years, right? So for instance, MA program, we have 13 students, eight of them, they were born in Goa, five of them, they came from other states. Just to make clear that sometimes we read, we read things which are not exactly the, the real picture. So now, Gyanendra, one of the students who came from uh, another state is doing MA in, at the Goa University. So I request Gyanendra to read a short text from Monsoon, if I'm not wrong. Boa tarde, todos. Eu vou, vou ler um certo de Monsoon do Bimala de Druba. Voltado para o Oriente, Druba cogitava no seu destino. Pela primeira vez, desde o Tali, sentia medo. Até aí tudo fora encantamento. Um sonho velho, e receiava que acabasse. Tudo a temorejava. O outro, os convidados que devastavam familiarmente toda a casa. A sogra imperiosa, absorvente, o sogro, o caque, todos o próprio marido. Tivera um estranho arrepio ao sentir aos, as mãos de Chandrakanta, atando com três nós. O tali ao seu pescoço, mas ao mesmo tempo admirava-se daquela sua reação. Ainda mal tinha a coragem de encarar aquele desconhecido que, ela agora, que era agora seu marido. E não achava uma razão que justificasse o seu estado de espírito. As leias tinham se cumprido e tudo decorrera como sempre. Nada havia de estranho, de diferente. Lembrava-se de como se sentira a rapariga mais feliz da aldeia. Ao saber, através do pai que estava arranjado o seu casamento com um rapaz da família de Sai. Uma das melhores casas do conselho ao estado Influente, lembrava-se também do dia em que enfeitara a sua longa trancha de de abolins e geios para anunciar o 
Nu-i da, nu vadu aos parentes e amigos. Recordava tudo, a alegria dos pais, do tio, todos ansiosos e contentes. A inveja das raparigas da sua idade, que a vela para estar tão feliz viravam-lhe as costas os dias do encantamento que por precederem. O tal, sonhos, esperanças, tremuras, que davam lugar a esta sensação de estranheza perante o desconhecido. Muito obrigado. Now I'll speak in Portuguese. Pronto, chegamos ao fim, penso eu. I think we, we reached the end. And I'd just like to show you the books of the Monsoon Translation in English and Life Stories, the recent translation of Paul Mel Castro, thanks to the great job of Frederick Moronha, is always behind the, the scenes, um, making this possible, making these books uh, reachable to all, all, the, all the people everywhere in the world. And I'm sure that if our students, instead of reading on mobile and PDF, if they can feel the texture and <laughs> smell, and I'm sure that they will be not better students, but in the future, better writers, better Indians, better citizens, uh, and everybody will be much happier. Muito obrigado, Deu Boré Cru, and Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.